Check the clocks. Smart or dumb. dumb. Smart watch, dumb watch, and anything in between. If you check that clock right now, you would find out that it is, in fact, a time to think. Chris, we had a worship event this Saturday, and someone came yeah. up to you, and they checked their clocks. They did. The clock that was on their wrist, uh, it was a gentleman I've known for a number of years now, in fact. Uh, lovely gentleman who plays guitar quite well uh, and should be listening to this podcast along with his lovely wife who uh, have made a suggestion, in fact, to us. And if you had a video camera on us right now, you would see... You don't want to have a video camera well, on us often, but if you had one right now... It would be an experience because we have constructed a sound booth. Sound this. booth that's 360 degrees, so I'm currently just spinning around right yep, now. spinning in circles. Josh and I are approximately two feet away from each other. Uh, but you know what? This series of podcast episodes is about relationships, and we yeah. have good relationships, so we can do this. Yeah, so we got a suggestion that our microphones were a little hollow, so we're just trying something new. We've, we've said in the past that uh, we're seeking to be a helpful podcast, and if we're accidentally good in the process, then it'll be a good full podcast podcast so when it comes to graphics or audio quality we're we're seeking to be adequate enough to be helpful and then anything on that is a plus right correct so we haven't really advertised the podcast very yeah. much you can see if you're on our youtube page we've stopped doing video just because it's more efficient for us to not need more bodies to do and this and poor teenage kids we're getting <laughs> you know roped into this on a regular basis we didn't want to burden them we got them politos one we day did. we got them food more yeah. than one day. I think we got him food a couple times. So you reference, we'll, we'll make a third reference to, uh, to Brogan as we're talking on the podcast. I was talking to him after church, and we came up with an idea that we should give away some sort of a time to think swag to everyone who gets vaguely referenced on the podcast, because yeah. we do a lot of vague references. Yep. We'll say, I was talking to a friend this week. Mm -hmm. Or in your case, you'll say, I've got a kid, and we don't know which of the six it is. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, in the future, that might be the case for me. Which of the two or three is he talking about? So if you get vaguely... Or the seven, eight, or nine, perhaps. <laughs> if, if I want to idolize Kevin DeYoung. <laughs> so we might, at some point, need to come up with some sort of, I got vaguely referenced on a time to think type of t-shirt to give out. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's in the works. We had a staff meeting this afternoon. Maybe we'll talk about it. That's a good idea. But now it is a good time to transition to our thinking topic today, which is marriage relationship round two. So uh, we tied together. Does that mean there was a round one, Josh? There was, and we both were victorious. So in if round they one. haven't listened to that, they should probably listen to that first. Yeah, so I think it's called defining relationship. Uh, that's a carefully crafted term because. Mm -hmm. Marriage is a defining relationship. It's a very important yeah. relationship, but also a relationship that needs definition. Boom. And so we had talked about the importance of language over the summer. We used marriage as a test case, a term that needs definition. And what were our three P's of the definition, Chris? Well, we had picture. Number two. <sighs> Chris needs to picture. spend more Wait time listening well, see, I don't listen to a to time to stuff think. that often. Picture. Procreation. Procreation and Wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. Okay, everyone partnership. else. Partnership. Partnership, okay. I can do this. I can do this. You just put me on the spot. I'm an old man. So. so apparently I can put Chris on the spot with any topic of conversation other than what did we talk about last time. I can put him on the spot with nuclear physics or, or there public policy. But the three piece of three marriage, piece. picture, I got him. I got procreation, him. And partnership. partnership, we discussed on the Defining Marriage Part 1. Uh, and that largely was on a cultural lens. How yep. do we define marriage in opposition to a culture that has changed marriage? And I would say pretty much has dwindled it down to just a shallow form of the partnership. Right. It's really only, does this other person make me happy? Does it benefit me? Right. So then it's, it's really leveled half of the partnership piece in the biblical framework, which is the idea of refining one another yep. towards a greater holiness. Yep. Um, and then it's, Totally cast aside procreation. That's not, you can do it if you want yep. to, but it's not fundamental to marriage. And it's certainly cast aside the idea of picture of Christ in the church. Um, so let's track with those three Ps, but this time thinking in terms of not op opposition to the culture, but your average married individual in the church. Um, mm -hmm. And so let's talk in terms of picture in Ephesians 5, where Paul okay. says, husbands love your wife as... 
Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. So the husband wife relationship, picture of Christ and the church, uh, and then wives called to a degree of honor and respect toward the husband that Mm -hmm. is indicative in the opposite direction of church. Uh, What do you see in that picture relationship for husbands and wives to think about in terms of marriage? Mm -hmm. So I I think, you know, this is something actually before, before Rosalind and I got married, we, we read a book, short book, uh, together, it was uh, called What's the Difference? Uh, I'm talking about gender roles. And a very short book by John Piper uh, came out from a long, long time ago. Long, long time ago. Long enough for me to have read it with my wife when we were engaged. So I um, read through that, and I, I think there's this sig- the significance of, of the marital relationship is that um, I, I think there are really two things that are pictured. I think, first of all, what we have is the relationship between Christ and the church, which is primary, right? I mean, that's a fundamental relationship that needs to be understood and that marriage provides an opportunity for people to see that. Uh, but then there's also even just the creation relationship that exists between men and women and complementarity that exists between male and female that, you know, you, you just see in the culture right now how that is being, you know, deliberately undermined, deliberately destroyed. So that, you know, the picture that a marital union between a husband and wife is supposed to communicate uh, is, is, I mean, the idea of a picture is completely gone now. And so as you look at what the picture is in the life of a believing couple, is it serves to, you know, when, I guess as, as pictures go, imagine going and seeing scribblings on the ground versus seeing, you know, a, a Rembrandt. And the Rembrandt, you look, it's like, man, that is an accurate representation of something. And I, I enjoy the beauty of that. And it looks good because it actually is representing something accurately. You look at some scribblings on the ground, you're like, okay, well, maybe that's abstract art, but, you know, I, I don't know, whatever. And so I, I would say as, as far as the picture aspect of the marital union is concerned, um, it's, it's so significant because it broadcasts a message as to what ought to be. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's almost an ontological issue that exists. Like, oh, man, the being of humanity, the being of marital relationship is bound up in the fact that it's picturing something more significant than itself. Yeah, define ontology for us for just a, yeah, a second. Yeah, just, just being. I mean, it's a study of being. And so, like, what what is, <laughs> basically? And nature, would that be another way to, the nature of a thing? Sure, yeah. sure, yeah. And and so the, the nature of humanity is bound up in male and femaleness, and the nature of marital union is bound up in Christ. And so you find these things brought together in the relationship between a man and woman in marriage so that you see both the, the creation and redemption aspects of humanity clearly and, displayed. And we need pictures. We need, mm-hmm. uh, we need tangible things that are natural in order to understand the immaterial, right? Yeah. We need material. That's, that's one of the kindnesses of God is that he's given us material and has helped us understand the immaterial. Mm-hmm. So when he wants to express uh, what the day of the Lord will be mm-hmm. like, uh, he says he speaks in terms of earthquakes mm. and in terms of clouds being Blood rolled moons. back, right? In terms, yeah, in terms of the moon changing its color, yeah. he takes a material object in the Book of Revelation mm-hmm. and he says, "Look at this tangible material object. Mm-hmm. This is what the immaterial, is the, like. you know, the return yeah. of the Lord will be like." And and that's all over the place when God wants to talk about his sovereign control over things, he uses the idea of a hand Mm -hmm. or a right hand, which is a strong hand, or it's a hand that has a scepter in it that rules. Mm -hmm. And so so just like those pictures that the Bible gives us, um, we're given a picture of marriage so that when someone sees biblically faithful marriage, they're supposed to see the nature of the relationship between Christ and the church. And so that's a really helpful, it's a daunting responsibility, but a helpful responsibility to remind it of is that Part of what my marriage does is it's supposed to show people mm. Christ and the church. Yep. And this is helpful because when we look at maybe the roles given in Ephesians 5, um, you see that the classic, well, Love and Respect is the book that was written, sure. right? And it's written because what you see in Ephesians 5 is husbands love your wives, mm-hmm. love. Wives respect your husbands. And... Um, there are kind of two different roles and you're saying, well, should wives not love their husbands or should husbands not respect their wives? I said, no, but in general, they're given two different approaches to those roles. Mm -hmm. The husband is called towards uh, service of the wife in laying down his life for her betterment. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes that will be laying down his own desires Mm -hmm. for her betterment, uh, particularly in regards to the idea of presenting her blameless. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it will look like laying down the desire to be passive Yep. in order to pursue her holiness and to engage in godly, 
loving disagreement or mm-hmm. conflict. And I know as a male, I would prefer to be passive. <laughs> so, so even in engaging in tough conversations, I have to lay aside my own personal sure. desires, right? And so that's kind of the posture of the husband, which mimics Christ, mm-hmm. who though he was in the very form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, mm-hmm. but humbled himself, t- taking on the form of a bond servant, becoming obedient to the point of death, mm-hmm. even death on a cross for his people. Mm-hmm. And so husbands have a posture that says, I am towards my wife in loving service in order to present her blameless, in order to cherish and nourish her. And so I have some God-given authority in this relationship, but it's an authority exercised in service, just as Christ says, uh, those of the Gentiles lord their authority Mm -hmm. over those who are underneath them, but it's not so with us. Yep. Uh, so we have this picture of Christ who does not come to be served, but to serve and give his life mm-hmm. as a ransom for many. And that's a paradoxical picture, Chris. What, what does it mean for someone to be a Lord who came to serve? Mm-hmm. Well, you're supposed to see that in a husband. Right. What does it mean for someone to be physically stronger, to be in a place of God-given authority, and yet you just keep seeing him serve? Mm-hmm. You keep seeing him give up his desires. Mm-hmm. Any reflections on that part of the picture? Yeah, I mean, it's... <sighs> You know, any culture is going to focus one way or another. I think traditionally throughout human history, the focus of masculinity has been lording, you know, and and not lording. I mean, for for a Christian, you hear Lord, you think of something positive. Uh, But for the rest of the world, you hear Lord and you think of like, oh, man, there's somebody who is telling me what to do in a way that does not benefit me. Overbearing, Um, restrictive, selfish. And they just want what's good for them and they don't care about anybody else. And so... Um, I think what needs to fu- fundamentally redefined for men and women when it comes to Christian marriage is the idea of like, what does it mean to actually lead, right? And because some, some guys will do things differently. I mean, I, I don't lead the way that other guys do, right. you know, so there's some guys who are more likely to sit down and do the laundry. Some guys who are more, li- more likely to go and, and do, I mean, I know for my part, the way I tend to lead is I lead verbally, you know, I lead through words. I, I like to communicate clearly to my family and in the ways that I think is best uh, for them to, to mm-hmm. honor God, right? Um, and so each guy is going to have to come up with his own idea as far as how he's particularly wired. But if you are not being characterized by desire to lead for the good of those in your home, mm-hmm. particularly for your wife, then you're missing the boat on what it means to actually take that role properly. That's super helpful, Chris, because it, it categorizes... Um so I would be more like you. I would tend to lead in more in a verbal capacity. I like to think I'm, I grew up with mostly women around the home, so I mm. tend to be a little bit more emotionally aware. Sure. Um, but I'm, I'm a pretty poor leader when it comes to getting minor projects around the house done. Sure. And so in that you see, okay, maybe I have a particular characteristic that leadership feels natural. Mm-hmm. Okay, leading the home in spiritual things or leading the home in emotional engagement. Those feel natural to me. And they would tend to be, if I thought about the word provision, I would say mm. to my wife, I am providing for you sure. this. However, I often have to grow in seeing that provision for my wife also includes uh, financial awareness of sure. what our budget looks like or taking care of our home in a way that she sees is adding to its value mm-hmm. or protecting it from decay. Sure. I'm not naturally geared that way. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not like you. I don't, I'm not as handy with tools. I, sure. I tend to shy away from those tasks. And so in that is just one example of I feel naturally geared toward one type of leadership. Mm-hmm. I have to grow in one type of leadership, mm-hmm. but all under the umbrella of leading for the good of my family. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So that's helpful, guys, is uh, you might look at other men and say, well, that person is gifted in this capacity. Uh, I know men who, golly, they can't stop unless a task is finished. Like they're mm-hmm. just, and, and that's respectable because mm-hmm. I, I can go, eh, whatever. I don't yeah. need to finish the task. And I have to learn to grow in that way. Mm-hmm. You might be more task oriented, task driven and realize that you need to grow in the emotional or spiritual engagement. Sure. Uh, but all of that is towards the picture of being like Christ Mm -hmm. who in loving service gave himself for the good of his bride. Yeah. Right. What do you see in the, the flip side of that picture as far as the church's relationship to Christ or the wife's relationship to the husband? Yeah. I mean, the the tough thing there is that it's a, it's a tough sell in our culture to Mm -hmm. get the idea across that it is good to be submissive to authority. Um, I mean, really the two things that are, that are central there. Authority and submission are two things that are really anathema to our culture. I mean, we don't like the idea of authority at all. 
we really don't like the idea that anybody would be over us. And I think you see a flattening even of uh, just this, uh, man, just this weekend. So I was on Twitter, I was thinking like, oh man, I'm, I'm interacting on some level with somebody who millions upon millions of people know. And it's like, okay, well, it doesn't seem very authoritative. Man, it wasn't me, huh? <laughs> No, Josh. You told me you don't want to. You don't want to meet me on Twitter. So, um, but you know the, the 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 place that we occupy now in our culture is that we see those who are in authority and we want to de-authoritativeize them. I guess that's not a real word, but I made it up. So we we don't want to think that authority exists, and and yet you see biblically that God cares deeply about authority and authority structures, even so far as to say that um, if there is what we would consider ungodly authority. We're still to show a certain degree of respect to that authority. Now, it's not to give in to calls to sin, but it is to say we defer to a certain degree um, to the authority over us that God has put, just so in, in part that they might be one, right? So that they might be one by respectful conduct instead of, you know, some type of an attitude that tells people... I'm thinking, is that First sand. Peter? Yeah, Yeah, First that Peter. you're thinking of? Yeah, First Peter is a significant place there. And, uh, you know, elsewhere you just hear the calls to you know, uh, honor the emperor, right? I mean, to, to, I mean, obviously we don't have an emperor right now. I mean, maybe some people might think we do, but point being uh, that we, we show respect to those in political authority and we show respect to those in the authority in the church and authority in the home. So we don't like that idea. And then secondly, you know, I guess just that trails into that is that we don't like the idea of submission, you know, and this is naturally born into us as human beings that to submit to somebody else means that we give up our sense of being central, to our own lives. And so what, what I like to tend to communicate when it comes to this issue of submission and respect within the life of the home is to say, look, there is goodness to be found in regarding God's design. There is goodness to be found there. And so if we look at submission as something that just eliminates our good, then we are fundamentally cutting off any potential of benefiting from what God has called us to. So for a man to say, you know, I just don't want to, I don't want to, what a man is doing is saying, I don't want to actually benefit from what God has designed. And so what is central to this idea in marriage of, of Christian commitment to what we call gender roles is faith. It's, it's a confidence that God is not a liar, confidence that God has, has done something, communicated it clearly, and so that if we follow what God has designed, that there is goodness in it. So as much as we might want to kick back against these things, there is a degree of faith that exists in a woman's heart because you're going to have to trust in a way that a man isn't necessarily going to have mm -hmm. to trust. A woman's going to have to trust that, yes, I can entrust myself, uh, as, as it says elsewhere in First Peter, entrust myself to a faithful creator while doing good. Mm -hmm. um, and that may mean that you have a husband that you may not like decisions he makes. You may disagree with him, but you can entrust yourself to God so that he will bless that submissive attitude to those in authority over you, even if you can't see what that's going to result in. Yeah, and to, to affirm, so just to be clear, we're getting the idea of submission from Ephesians 5, which 18 through 24-ish basically says, uh, ends with sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So there's a church component of we right. submit to one another. And then the word submit is doubled down upon in a distinction between yes. man and woman. Yep. And um, and this, like you said, submission is not a, a popular term, but it's supposed to get at this idea that the church is in a relationship of trust and dependence upon mm -hmm. the Lord. Yep. And... It sounds odd to say, but there is a great benefit in learning to trust. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, how often, Chris, have you and I been in a position as pastors where we come to the end of ourselves, we realize we can't get someone to do what we want mm -hmm. them to do. We realize that our preaching can't accomplish what we want right. it to accomplish. We realize this podcast can't do what we want. And so we have to get to the end of ourselves and say, I trust the Lord. Right. And uh, I think that to a degree, that's what is happening in the the female side of marriage representing the church is to say, uh, there's a degree to which women are called to trusting in that relationship that is functionally different yep. than what men are called to. Men are called to sacrifice in that relationship, which is a little functionally different. Yep. And women are called to trusting in that relationship, which is a little functionally different. Yep. And so the roles given um, are are in tandem. And I think that's so important. It's, um, it's not that, 
a woman can only respect or trust when a man is is leading well, mm-hmm. or that a man can only lead a well when, when a woman is respecting right. and trusting. It's that both parties are to be fighting in that direction together. The man fighting to sacrifice his own desires for the good of his yep. family, for the good of his wife. The woman fighting to sacrifice her desire to take control mm-hmm. in, in order to trust. And, yep. and I think most women that I have talked to, their husbands tend to be a little slower than they would like. Sure. Yep. <laughs> a little slower in this area of growth, a little slower mm-hmm. in this area of understanding. Yep. I know my wife would say that to a degree that she has burdens on her heart that I just don't yet see as important. Sure. And she really has to slow down and trust. Um, I remember early in our marriage, we had a theological disagreement. And it, for me, it felt like a kind of a collegiate dispute, but for her, it felt very real. It was mm. very early in a marriage. It was like, it was almost like a, is this the guy that I married? Sure. Like almost an identity type thing. Yep. And I remember her telling me years later that she prayed in that moment, Lord, I need you to work in him. Mm. And it, it must've been a year or so later where I said, Hey, I've been thinking about this. And she's like, I told you that a year ago. Mm. But in, in the moment, her posture was, I can't change him, but the Lord can change him. Mm-hmm. And uh, I tell this to people in premarital counseling tell them to both man and woman at the same time. I I say, man, if you are not following Christ, you will find no reason to change in this marriage. Mm. You will get married. You will think you've won the battle. You've secured the victory. It's done. You've got the price. You'll have no reason to change other than if your wife asks you and then you wanted to get her off your back. And then, and I said, I'll say wife, you will have no reason to slow down and trust unless you know he's following Christ mm. and you trust the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so you will have things he, you want him to change yeah. that you will need to pray about first. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a helpful one analogy of what it looks like for the husband to sacrifice, the wife to trust, mm-hmm. and for those two things to work mutually together. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So that's picture. And that's kind of um, a big bulk of, of that. I do, maybe I'll give one analogy inside the church that's not inside the home that helps with this idea of servant leadership and trusting submission. Uh, we think about elders in the mm-hmm. church. Uh, I, when we're admitting someone to membership, I often describe the elder member relationship as a dance. The dance being the members are responsible for identifying mm-hmm. and confirming through a congregational vote who will lead them. Yeah. And then responsible to following those who will lead them. Mm-hmm. The men who are leading them are responsible to serve in their leadership right. and to think about the good of the flock over their own yes. good. And in so doing, the members of the church are able to uphold certain men as qualified to lead them and mm-hmm. to trust them. Yep. And the men are constantly put in a situation where they need to make sure that their leadership is exercised for the good of the people mm-hmm. and not their own. Um, and I think that that's another example of what happens with servant leadership and godly trust. Absolutely. Okay. So that's picture marriage in the church. Uh, so that might be something where if you're listening here, you can, as a, as a male, you can think, where are the areas that I am prone to servant leadership? Where are the areas that I'm prone to selfish leadership or yeah. neglectful leadership or abusive leadership? Yeah. Do I, am I domineering? Am I evasive? Mm-hmm. Where, where am I prone to serve? Where do I need to grow in my yeah. service of leadership? Um, if you're a woman, you might ask, where am I having a hard time trusting? Where am I have a hard time praying for my husband versus yeah. telling him what needs to be changed? Um, Maybe if you're in an unhealthy spot in your marriage, you might identify who outside of us in this church can help us both together Mm -hmm. because we're just not able to do this on our own. And that would be where elders or uh, a larger community can come in Mm -hmm. and help the husband and the wife pursue those things together. Uh, Let's talk about the partnership piece, Chris, because I think, you know, we said in the Defining Marriage podcast that procreation is something that exists pre-fall and Mm post-fall, right? It was an interesting pre-fall, post-fall thing with partnership too. Mm-hmm. Pre-fall, it's the man shall not be alone. It's not good for him to be alone. Yeah. Here's a partner. Post-fall, it's there's there's enmity. Mm-hmm. Um, the wife will be opposed to the husband, mm-hmm. and so we we see that the opposite maybe of that picture of servant male leadership and godly female trust would be people that are not in partnership but in competition. Yeah. Um, and so that would, 
What are your reflections on the idea of not working together in that picture, but working opposed to one another? Mm-hmm. What do you see the effects of sin and marriage in regards to that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, is, it is no different than any other relationship um, that exists in the human experience, right? I mean, you, you will find conflict that exists. I mean, it just that's will happen in the book of James. You know, what causes fights and quarrels among you? You know, is it not the other just, person? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's it's you don't get what you want. Yeah. You know, and, and that's that's really it. And so, any relationship, the closer that it gets to you, the closer proximity that relationship has, the more your desires are going to be competed hmm. with. That's good, right? And so, if if I don't know somebody and they're walking down the street and they're talking to me, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to have conflict with them unless they're aggressive toward me, right? Because they're not threatening my desire to have my way. But then the closer you get. And, and the, the more you get to know somebody, the more opportunity you have, just based on time, the more that that person is going to represent a threat to you, potentially, um, in relationship to what you want. And so the idea of partnership pre-fall is the idea that, you know, you are doing God's will together, right? So you're seeking a common mm-hmm. goal, a common end, and you're just, you're doing it because that's, it's not stained or colored by anything selfish. Mm-hmm. But after the fall, your desires are now against what God wants primarily, right? And so um, when we are individually seeking what we desire apart from an objective standard of good, then that will inevitably create conflict. And and within a marriage, uh, the, the proximity plus the reality of sin just creates uh, an environment where there can be significant conflict mm-hmm. and significantly hurtful conflict. Uh, so, you know, you're going to be most hurt by your spouse, that's just what's going to happen. I mean, the most hurtful person in your life will probably be your spouse mm-hmm. to one degree or another. Because Not only in frequency, but in depth. Yeah, but in depth. If frequency, you're just going to get at each other. Right. Uh, and here's a little pro tip. If it happens on Sunday mornings between 7 a.m. <laughs> and 10 a.m., it's Satan. Yes. All right? Yes, that it's, is correct. So if it happens throughout the other week, it might just be you got to work through something. <laughs> if it happens randomly right when you wake up on Sunday, uh-huh. it's spiritual attack. Get over it. Yeah. Come, to, come to church. That happens. I still have a... a Christmas Eve service or Christmas morning service, my, my wife and I were at a bit of an argument and it was over essentially how to open gifts on Christmas. <laughs> I wanted it to be quick. I wanted, it was a silly little argument, yeah. but it lingered as we walked into church. Sure. And sure. I was sitting here as the pastor going, I got to get over this because I got a uh-huh. lady worship service. More than uh, gift opening skills. And so we it. prayed and right after we prayed, my son hilariously turned the computer off. So I was like ready to get after it. <laughs> it was just a mess. But the whole point there is, Satan attacked the partnership before a worship service. Right. Um, and and that's Satan's MO is to get us, get our eyes off of the Lord, off of the common good, off of the partnership mm-hmm. and onto ourselves. Yeah. And um, and so just a heads up, a lot of a lot of marital fights happen on Sundays. Yeah. Uh, and that's because Satan wants to attack our worship. Yeah. And um, the way he does that is by getting us preoccupied with ourselves mm-hmm. and telling us how often someone else is in the way of ourselves. Right. Like you're saying with the desires. And I was reading... Um, Recently, one guy said basically that most anxiety comes from a self preoccupation. Sure, I'm yep. so concerned with myself yep. that I and I. You could say that something similar is happening in marriage. A lot of marital strife starts with a self preoccupation. Mm-hmm. Here's what I want for me, or I want for us, and yep. you're getting in the way. Yep. Uh, and I know that my most unhealthy moments as a husband or a father is when I feel like my family's getting in the way mm. of what I want, and I can feel it. I'm like, you're interrupting the thing that I want right. to do, and so if we can pinpoint that and go, oh, that's me post-fall mm-hmm. being selfish rather than me being a servant leader looking for the, yeah. the common good. Yep, absolutely. Um, any other things you would say that you've observed that, okay, these are kind of markers that my desires are getting in the way or we're, we're, we're at odds because we have competing desires. Where do you see that flesh out in marriage? Well, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. I mean, and it, and it, it Wherever really is just, sinners uh, are. Yeah, I, I just go back to the whole idea of the fact that as a Christian, you're called to an objective standard, right? There's an objective standard that exists. And so you go to scripture and you say, what does God's word say is right and good for me to pursue? Now, going to the picture uh, and the idea of submission and leadership, I think that's where you know some of this partnership becomes disrupted is because people don't feel that, that a partnership can exist if there's an authority relationship as well. So people will say things like, well, you know, I just, I, 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 can't, I can't respect you. 
or I can't, I can't lay my life down for you. And they'll give the reasons why and say it's, it's based on the other person. And, and it's not because, generally speaking, at least in my experience, it's not because you look at the other person and say, well, here is clear sin, and so I, I can't be part of this. It's not like, oh, I can't lay my life down because you're calling for me to go and rob a bank. I mean, that's, that's not typically the issue. It's, well, I can't lay my life down for you because you want to do this. You know, that's the issue. It's the, I, I, I prefer this. I like this. Well, you know, so I'm you're just saying not it's gonna... not extreme cases like abuse typically Correct. where some, we're arguing with submission or Yeah, so at least in a Christian servant. home. In yeah. a Christian home, yeah. And so it's typically a matter of my desires not being met. Therefore, I'm not going to fulfill my responsibility in marriage. So, you know, you chip away then at that sense of obligation to honor God regardless of what you get from it or regardless of what the consequences are for the partnership itself. And so that's where selfishness really starts kind of going at it, which is why we need to be committed first and foremost to keeping roles in view so that as we keep our roles in view, we can understand the partnership as more than just what we benefit from. Yeah, it. so for the most part, the question is not, have they fulfilled their role as the first question, but right. have, I have I fulfilled yes, mine? Exactly. And if both people are asking that question, roles are getting it fulfilled. Yes. So what's super interesting is what causes the discord is selfishness, thinking of myself first, but what, what hesitates the repair is thinking of the other person yep. first. Yep. So we're in disagreement because... I need this, but we won't get back together because you need to do this. And you're like, okay, if we could flip that yeah. and we pursued what's good for you mm-hmm. first in the partnership, in the role, and then when there is discord, what can, what I, can I do yes. first? I will, I'll tell you, man, one of the most humbling things as a husband is when my wife apologizes first. And sure. I go, oh, man, I that done was that. my role. <laughs> yeah, I should have done that. Yeah. And I go, I'm not, you know what? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for in humility doing that first. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. and I actually bear the responsibility here mm-hmm. because um, I have only thought about what you need. Mm-hmm. But but in God's grace, as soon as the apology comes, I realize, oh man, yeah. uh, I'm here too. Yeah. Um, and so, like you said, this happens everywhere. It happens in small and large ways. Um, but one of the commonalities here is that if we can lift our eyes off of ourselves onto who the Lord is in the relationship of Christ in the church, how we're supposed to picture that, and then how God has given us partners. Mm-hmm. How easy is it to forget that the wives we have or for women, the husband, husbands we have are partners? Yeah. Um, I, so another piece of this is not just self-desire, but, but gratitude. Yeah. I know it's so easy for me on really good days to think, well, yeah, that's my wife. Mm-hmm. But on really bad days to think, why is she like this? <laughs> and I'm, think about it though. It's like right. you, you come to assume what's good is normal. Yeah. And then you expect that. And then you get mad when it doesn't happen. And mm-hmm. that happens in friendships. That happens in marriage. That right. happens in the church. Yep. So you say, okay, well, the community that we have here is normal. Everywhere has it. Yeah. The welcoming environment, the casual atmosphere, mm-hmm. the gospel centered preaching. Yeah. That's normal. We have to have that. It's expected. And then when something happens, you don't, you're not grateful for the normal right. that you have. You're, I can't believe that. Yeah. yeah. And so we should be on guard that we should be regularly practicing what we are grateful for in the partner mm-hmm. so that the totality of the partner picture mm-hmm. is, is, is in my mind saying, no, okay, here's, here has the, is, here's how the Lord has been gracious to me and giving mm-hmm. me my yeah. wife. And so, yeah, sometimes there's part of the partner that are frustrating and <laughs> And so on for her as well. There's often parts of the partner that are frustrating, right. and yet we're still partners. Yep. Um, I think it's that. Those are the, probably the most fun. I don't know about you. The most fun I have is when I look at my wife and I say, "Oh, we're we're working together on sure. this." Sure. You know. Sure. Um, I yeah, think one P left, Josh. I don't know if we're gonna. I think we're gonna cover that right now. Yeah, I mean, we can do it quickly. Um, procreation, do it. Yeah. That's good. Yes, that's the end of our um, conversation in that. The Lord has blessed both of our bodies with, with new life recently. Yeah. Um, I think maybe what I would suggest we think about, and it's really hard for me because I'm trying to lead a prayer meeting and I'm trying to encourage young families to come to the prayer meeting yeah. and then my son is making noise. And you know what I think? He's distracting. Mm. But you know what my heart wants every other parent to think? Your child is, is that not a distraction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so maybe that's the point here is father's, Procreation and child rearing is not a distraction. Right. Mothers, the the time you're putting in now is not a waste. Yeah. It's not keeping you from other things. Yeah. God has designed us and called us towards procreation as a part of the picture of marriage. Yeah. It's not a waste. That's maybe what yeah. I would say. What about you? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would I would say in terms of even Sunday mornings, uh, the way I, I tend to communicate to people, and it's and it's tough because you don't want to single out a new family who might be there and, and say, well, by the way, here's our policy on families. But you know, I I do try to make it very clear that you know just just <laughs> children are not a distraction in the church. They're not. I mean. I know it's embarrassing. You know, I've got six kids. I know that they can say things and do things that can be embarrassing. But, you know, if your child's making a fuss in church, um, I, I, you know, I understand. But I would say even that you have a nursery, you know, a nursery exists as a, an accommodation. But it's not because we want to shuffle children off to nursery and just say, well, you should go there because we don't have a place for you here. It's to say, man, the church is a family family. And we just had a, a dedication uh, last weekend for a couple of families in our church. And... It was so awesome. It was so awesome to, to have that dedication done because we're recognizing here these children are uh, an important part of the life of this church because God has entrusted them to our care. And so, you know, the church should have that attitude that children are not a hindrance to our worship. Children are part of our worship. And within the life of the home, children are not a, a burden. And, uh, you know, just uh, I think it was, was it Emily Rakowski? Is that how you pronounce her name? I don't know. I think so. She's the, the model. She's the model, Okay. And she um, put a uh, put a statement out. Uh, it was some type of video where she, I think, she's getting divorced or got a divorce or something like that. And she was talking about how it's it's so great, it's so great to to hit your twenties and thirties and realize that, you know, this is all for you. It's all for you. And and basically, you're wasting your time uh, as a woman uh, if if you are throwing yourself after a marriage, throwing yourself after children. And this is a common mentality now. I think you know people in our generation and younger. You have people saying things like, oh, you know what? Children are just, you know, they keep me from living the life I want to live. And it's like, what what a stupid view of life that is. I mean, first of all, you see the rejection of marriage. And oh, my question it. is always, uh, how'd you get here? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, it's, I mean, in a more, you know, kind of morbid way, it's like with abortion. People are like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm all for abortion. It's like, man, what, what would that mean for you? Yeah. You know, if, if that had somebody had been for abortion and saw you as an inconvenience, saw you as a problem. That's how it shows our heart's desires lead us to think illogically. Exactly. One of the reasons we have a podcast called The Time to Think is because our heart's desires lead us to think illogically. Yes. So someone who has been born, has been reared, has had a mother, ideally a mother and a father, give mm-hmm. of their lives to them for two decades in order to send them on a way where they right. have the chance for some sort of emotionally healthy life or Mm -hmm. successful life or education, yada, yada, yada. It's then we now take this and go, and it's all about me. Yep. As if there wasn't, uh, and that's where, um, this is, man, you went morbid. I'm going to go morbid here. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is where Tim Keller talks about suicide actually as as not a sin that only impacts the individual. Mm -hmm. That might be the the sin that you think, well, this is the only one that impacts the individual. Right. But, but Keller goes on to say, what about the mother who has reared? What mm-hmm. about the church leaders who have invested? What about yeah. the Boy Scout leader or the teachers that actually mm-hmm. even the most individual of sins, in quotations, yeah. is a community, it's a, it's a community loss yep. and grief because humans are community people. Mm-hmm. We are raised by uh, groups of people. We are invested by mm-hmm. groups of people at various times. Yeah. Um, and man, I don't know where... Where did where did we start here before? I... <laughs> oh, we talked about children. Not seeing and, children uh, as like a waste yeah, or an inconvenience. Burden. Yeah, yeah. And so they're, they're really not. I mean, I I understand. I understand the difficulties involved with you know how do you how do you adjust to life with children? You know, I I understand that. And I, you know, for my part, I've always wanted kids since I was a, a kid. You know, I mean, it was always my biggest fear that I wouldn't be able to have children. And so you know, I'm thankful because my deepest desire as an adult human being, uh, apart from the Lord and from marriage, is to have kids. And so um, I, I don't think that's a hurdle I ever had to, to leap over. But there are a number of reasons people might look at children and see them as a, a problem, you know, based on their background or based on their, their desire, you know, career, that kind of a thing. And um, I just, you know, when you hear God say, in the creation mandate, and you know, we call in the world of theology the creation mandate, it's the first thing coming out of God's mouth toward humanity as a whole is to be fruitful and multiply, you know, fill the earth and subdue it. God's design for humanity, and I think this is, it, it's helpful to see the, the, the soundness and the truth of the Bible in just how the culture responds to it, because in an increasingly ungodly culture, what is it that people hate the most right now? And it's the idea of of humanity using environment as a public good in the progress of humanity through 
childbirth and raising families, right? I mean, everything right now is striking against that, whether it is the, the inherent infertility of same-sex relationships, whether it is the disgusting act of mutilation that occurs for those who call themselves transgender individuals, whether it is the act of abortion, these are all or even just regular old individualism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just casual sex that uh, you know. Now, by all I was even just thinking in terms of telling Chris over the course of Chris's life that his job in life is to be what he wants to be. Yeah. yeah. I'm man. We went through. Okay, we're gonna actually pause this. Here's here's pause a segue. Yeah. Pause. You gotta listen to the next episode because we're gonna talk particularly about parenting. Okay. And so I want to talk about the father's heart disposition yeah. toward the kid, or the mother's heart disposition toward the kid, or how do we raise and instruct. So mm-hmm. we're gonna pause this. We're pausing right before I wanted to say something spicy. Let's see All if right. I remember it. Um, I do want to end this podcast about marriage with discussing those who are unmarried. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's say there's someone who has got to this point and they're single, they've heard that marriage is picture, procreation, and partnership, and they're going, yeah, but I don't have it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or we have a bunch of married people that have gotten into this podcast and they don't regularly think about single people. Sure. Take either of those questions and I'll take the other one. Yeah. What what say you either to single people or to married people who need to consider single people? Yeah, I think to single people it is, and, and it's funny because I think, you know, when I was cutting my teeth early on in my Christian life, it was still towards the tail end of the focus on the family movement. The idea that, you know, like, oh, man, you got you to gotta get married. You totally got to get married. I think it's shifted now to a degree, even within the church, to say, well, you don't need to get married because you just need to kind of live a, an adventurous life for Jesus. And it's like, well, okay, that's, that's a different end of the spectrum. But that being said, there, there really is still a desire people have uh, to be in a relationship with somebody, and for Christian people specifically, uh, to be married. I mean, that's just a genuine desire, and it's a, it's a good desire. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, that being said... You know, let's look first and foremost here at the Lord Jesus and realize that Jesus was not married. Uh, he is married to his church. And so there is, I, I think, a place to see the goodness of human relationship within the life of a local church. And it's not just because we're pastors and saying this, but the local church exists to provide, in some ways, uh, a an accommodation for deficit, mm-hmm. but also in other ways to point forward to the fact that Jesus himself said you know, that in the world to come, in the new heavens, the new earth, there will be no marriage, right? And so even, um, uh, you know, I think this is something that can be helpful to think about. Even in a marriage relationship, even the most healthy, wonderful, caring, godly marriage that can exist, that marriage is temporary. Mm-hmm. But your relationship with the church is forever. It really is. Yeah. And, and so you cultivate your relationship with Jesus and you cultivate your relationship with the local church. And I know the probably the most couple fruitful years of my entire life, that I ever had were single years where I was enabled to invest in the life of God's kingdom. I mean, that's just what I was able to do. And it was great. Now, there are different benefits, blessings that attach to marriage, but it, it's not a waste. Singleness is not a waste as long as you don't regard it as a waste. Yeah. I think that's what I would, would say there. Yeah, I think that's good. You, you said it's a accommodation to deficit. Another way to put that would be the local church is a is a redeeming yeah. community. So it's not only a family of families, but a family that redeems family. Yeah. So I think my favorite part of our church right now is seeing uh, people that have either tough relationships with their children mm. or don't have grandchildren who now have good relationships with people my age yeah. or they have babies to hang out yeah, with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, people like myself who have never had, I, I didn't grow up with a brother. Mm-hmm. I have brothers. Yep. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more on the friendship podcast mm-hmm. coming up soon is the idea of brotherhood and sisterhood. I have, I have brothers who now eight years into Wausau, we've had some ups and some downs yeah. and that's what happens with a brother, right? Is yeah. like in, in a family, you have to stay together because of blood mm-hmm. in the church. You stay together because of Christ. Of blood. <laughs> um, amen. Woo. Come on, Chris. <laughs> and so I think for, uh, for the single folk, I would say, seek the ways in which the church can be a family of redemption yeah. for you. Um, which, and, and seek seeing yourself as a part of that, which is you might not be married, but you might be a sister or a brother to somebody. Yeah. And, and in a real way, a redemptive part of that relationship. Um, and then in, in the second part would be, Hey, what are the things that marriage is good for that you might not have something like refining or yeah. partnership? You might have to look for that yeah. a little harder because you don't have someone in the home that's regularly friction against your own desires uh-huh. and or regularly supporting you in your griefs and losses. Yeah. So then that would transition to the married couples to say, 
How often, if you're married, do you think of those who are unmarried? Yeah. How often do you think of the regular need for just simple table fellowship? Mm -hmm. How often do you take for granted the regular communication you have with your spouse and someone who might need more regular communication, Mm -hmm. either in hanging out or texting or check-ins or whatever it may be? How can you, as someone who's married, be intentional about looking around and going, oh, God has not gifted in this current season of someone else's life, a spouse partner to picture the gospel. How can I do that and be that family redemption? Mm -hmm. Picture it in a brotherhood or a sisterhood. Picture it as I welcome someone old or young or in between into our families. And so we can be aware of those who are at different life stages and incorporate them and support them and them us. In that way. Yeah, I want to want to give a shout out here. You know, maybe he'll get the swag in the mail, actually. Are you going to give a vague shout out? No, I'm going to give a specific okay. one. A specific one. So um, a couple years ago, we, uh, we had a, a guy show up um, late summer, early fall uh, at, our, at our church. And his name is Caleb. And uh, Caleb, you're probably listening to this now because I told you to. Uh, but, you know, Caleb is from Florida. And uh, Caleb spent time at the University of South Carolina, the real USC, the real USC, not uh, out on the West Coast. Uh, but when he went there, and he, he came up here because of a job. And he, was, he knew that he was going to be up here for probably like, man, I think it was maybe 10 months, 9, 10 months, something like that. And then he was going to head back south when he was going to get married. Uh, he uh, was, was dating a gal named Bree. They're married now and everything. But Caleb moved up here, and Caleb grew up in a really solid Christian home. And, uh, you know, had a, had a really good head on his shoulders as he came up to a place completely different than what he grew up in. You know, he's from the South. He's a Southern boy. And uh, he came up to Wisconsin. And I saw one of the coolest things. And, 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 you know, the guys in Stevens Point, we love Caleb. We still, he's still in our fantasy football league. It's kind of a big deal to us mm-hmm. because, you know, we, uh, we, we generally, you know, keep that in a kind of a, you know, these are close relationships we have yep. in the fantasy league. And he spent pretty much the entire time he was up here invested in the life of the church, knowing he was going to leave, Mm -hmm. knowing he was going to go back south, that he wasn't going to be sticking around long term, uh, knowing that he had a a, a gal that he was looking forward to getting married to. But he spent that time invested when he could have very well said, I'm not going to be here that long. He could have said, I'm going to just spend my evenings talking to my future wife. I'm going to do that, or I'm just going to sit here and, and, and lament the fact that I have to deal with winter weather. I mean, most of the time that he was up here was during colder time. But the man invested himself wisely and well into literally the last stages of his singleness in the life of a church that he was not going to stick around with simply because of circumstance. And I look at that, and I'm like, that is a picture, that is a mm-hmm. model of a man who understands what it is like to see the priorities for relationship that even when marriage is on the horizon, that there is an even more significant investment that can be made than just looking in front of your own face at the person you wake up next to. So, Caleb, love you, man. We miss you. Hmm. So Beautiful. Uh, it's fun to give people shout-outs and just to see in which, uh, talk about pictures, the ways in which God uses his people to picture something, Yeah. right? Um, so this has been a time to think, a thoughtful, careful engagement with issues regarding the culture and the church. We got a lot more relationships to talk about. The next one we'll we'll go into because we just talked about it was parenting. We also want to talk about um, friendships. Friendships. So I have no friends, Josh. Okay, you do. There's one standing in this weirdly close thing together right now. Don't just say it's the Lord, Josh. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about friend, friendships as well. And, uh, and move on from there. But a lot of relationships, uh, and I think it's been good discussion so far. Yeah. If you've made it this far, then I hope you find this to be a helpful podcast. You might share it with someone who's married or subscribe. unmarried. You might subscribe. Yeah. You might rate it. Uh, if you've made it this far and you don't think it's helpful, it's probably just because you fell asleep it was a highlight or people. something. But this has been a time to think. We'll see you next time. Thanks for taking some time thinking with us.